I recently came across a comment by the great French philosopher and existentialist, Albert Camus, a comment, comment which caught my attention. Here is my slight adaptation of what Camus wrote, and I quote, a person's life is a slow and unfolding journey based on three or four formative images in his or her youth, in whose presence his heart first opened." End quote. Images from our youth, images that have helped form us as adults, pictures of who we were then and out of which we have become what we are now. And most provocative, Provocatively, images in whose presence our heart first opened. And this suggestive comment got me to thinking about the powerful images of my own youth, images which have ripened and nourished and guided me into the adult I have become. And perhaps as I reflect now on four of my own formative experiences, you too might begin to think back to those of your own youth, experiences that have been powerful in making you who you have become and who you are still becoming. I grew up in Shaker Heights on Lomon Boulevard near Lee Road. And most every day during my high school years, I walked to the high school with a dear friend of mine. Now this friend lived half a mile away on Avalon Road, and he would come to my house early in the morning to pick me up for our walk together. And while waiting for me to get ready, he would take a seat on a rather high stool in our kitchen and chat with my mother while she was fixing lunches for her three children. And this is the pattern which repeated itself almost daily during all of my high school years. I can still see in my mind's eye this friend of mine on that stool with my mother. And when many years later my friend got married, my mother gave him that very stool <laughs> as a wedding present. Now, during those walks together, we discussed many things, things we have in common, things that stimulated our imaginations, the books we were reading, and the sports we both played and loved. From time to time, we would go to the gym after school and get a basketball and play horse or one-on-one. -on -one. And we had the time of our lives during those hours. And over those years, and during those walks or those one-on-ones, our friendship gradually deepened and our hearts opened to one another and to all that deep friendships can mean in life. And many years later, I came across the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne and read his great essay on friendship in which he describes his relationship with Etienne de la Boissy, in which Montaigne, Montaigne says about friendship that it is, and I quote, one soul finding itself in two bodies. This description resonated and still resonates with me. After high school, my friend and I went to different colleges Though after a year at Georgetown University, transferred to the college I was attending so that we could again enjoy our friendship firsthand and room together. And over the years, though we lived far apart, we would meet from time to time to renew our connection. And though we saw each other less and less over the years as our careers and our locations diverged, this friendship opened up in me the yearning for more friendships and for more close connections with more people. And one of the blessings of my life has been the many people 
with whom I have friendships, people who enrich my life, as do so many of you who are sitting right here in this sanctuary in front of me. All of my many friendships, some deep and some casual, are crucial to me. And my desire for the pleasure of friendship emerged, I have come to feel, from the impact of that blessed early friendship, so precious in itself and so formative of the person I am and seek to be today. The second and simple image out of my youth is one that I still see in my mind's eye. The image of a little boy, me, sitting in our family sunroom listening to music. Now music had always been an important part of our family life because my beloved parents, and especially my mother, loved the music of the big bands of the 1930s and 1940s. The bands of Count Basie and Bob Crosby and Benny Goodman and Duke Ellington. This was music that I too enjoyed, and who would not enjoy it? But this was not the music that I felt so deeply. And I still see that little boy sitting in a chair, listening to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and to Brahms' First Symphony, enraptured by the sound and the melody, as well as the ingenuity and the sheer energy that came at me from the development of those melodies and that sound. These were moments when my heart, once and forever, opened up to the glorious prospect of a life with music. It is a big world, music, of endless creativity and emotional depth. And those of you who love this kind of music know exactly what I mean. Moreover, I have been so fortunate to have found dear friends with whom to share the music that I love. Speaking of which, one of the ways which some of my friends and I come together around our common passion for music is attending the Metropolitan Opera's, opera's encore presentations of full operas at movie theaters here in Cleveland. How well I remember one frigid and blustery winter night when one of my dear friends and I cautiously and slowly faced the storm and drove to a rather distant theater to experience on the screen Richard Wagner's De Meistersinger von Nuremberg, the master singers from Nuremberg. How we rejoice together in anticipation on the way, even though that blizzard frequently limited our vision as we drove. How we laughed when upon entering the theater itself, we saw that the two of us and two other people comprised the entire audience. And how during the intermission, after the first act of almost two hours, my friend, who had not enjoyed the first act, <laughs> turned to me and with a wry smile asked, how would you feel about walking home? <laughs> but he stuck it out. And at the end of the, that marathon opera, with the two of us now the only ones still in the theater, he turned to me and he uttered one simple word, wow. Two powers, two images of friendship and of music, and how each can deepen the other. How lucky I feel that so early in my life, my heart was open to two of the greatest and inexhaustible blessings of my life. And that same little boy found himself one Yom Kippur morning feeling the need to walk to the synagogue for services. Now, I must confess to you that as a child, 
I never enjoyed Sunday school, never warmed to the services. Temple in those days meant very little to me. I attended without the slightest interest and only because my parents made me go. Moreover, the after-school public bus trip to Hebrew school had interfered with my baseball and basketball practices. How could I love Temple? Nevertheless, from a very early age, I had what I might call spiritual yearnings. And these yearnings moved me to think about God and about prayer and about the idea of holiness and about my place in the universe and in the Judaism of my inheritance. A kind of search for an authentic spirituality began to stir within that little boy. And so early one Yom Kippur morning, I don't know precisely how, how old I was, but I couldn't have been much older than 11 or 12, I announced to my father that I didn't want to drive to the temple with him in the car. Rather, I told him I wanted to walk to our temple, Temple Emmanuel on Green Road, some five and a half miles away. My father, as I recall, was bemused by my assertion. Yet he told me that he nevertheless preferred that I come with him in the car. Or perhaps he insisted on it. I don't know which. But I quietly insisted myself, intuiting that I needed the long and quiet walk in order to think about the meaning that Yom Kippur might have for me. And so my father finally relented and went along with my plan, but only part way. Because, as I again recall, he drove slowly and quietly beside me all the way to the temple. Partly because he wanted to be sure that I was safe, and partly because he believed that my fantasy about walking would disappear rather quickly. But it didn't. And I made it all the way, though I must admit that I was comforted by my father's presence in the car not very far away from me. And this image of myself as a child insisting on walking in order to explore a deep need the image of that experience opened my heart to the power of religion. It's one of the elements that continues to animate my life. A life of continuous inquiry, of continuous searching and discovery, and of the continuous blessing of immersing myself, along with so many of you, in the religion and the religious life that expands and enriches my life and offers me deep wisdom and deep gratification. In this case as well, the child became the father of the man. But accompanying this picture of my earliest spiritual yearnings and my earliest search for faith was also accompanied by questioning and doubt. And as many of you well know, I have something of a predilection for philosophy. And I read the great skeptics, the Greek, the Greek sophists, David Hume, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Bertram Russell, among others, with great pleasure and with great insight. These thinkers force me to think about my convictions. And so questioning, Doubting is as much in my bones as is the search for a sturdy faith. And so that first picture of the little boy searching for a deep religious experience one Yom Kippur morning long ago, that picture is still trailed by another one of that little boy questioning the very experience he was so fervently 
seeking. But I love the comment by the poet Emily Dickinson, who once wrote to a friend that, and I quote her, I believe and I doubt a hundred times every hour. And she concludes her comment, doubt keep it, keeps believing nimble. Honest doubt, a doubt that seeks clarification and authenticity. Honest doubt, Dickinson implies, is a friend of authentic faith, not its opponent. And so I rejoice in my skepticism as much as I do in my faith. Both are crucial to me, and both have come from the experience of that little boy from whom I have become the person I am. These then are four of the great and simple images in whose presence my heart first opened. The images of the power of friendship, the potency of music, the fervent search for faith, and the clarifying power of doubt. Those youthful images continue to live within me and continue to tell me who I am, what I believe, and what continues to empower my life. But I sense, finally, that what I have been talking about here is really about joy. The joy that I experience, filled as it is with friends, with music, with the pleasures and the tensions between faith and doubt. Nietzsche wrote, and I quote, joy wills and wants eternity, end quote. Not for Nietzsche, the kind of eternity that may come after we die, but the kind that promises more and more vitality richer and richer life right here in this world and in our own limited days on earth. Indeed, the power of joy begets the search for more and more of it. And lucky is the person who can experience it over and over again. And now in conclusion, I wonder about you. I wonder about your own early experiences and the impact that they have made on you and how they may have opened your hearts to the possibilities of life and out of which you have come to be the person you are and the person that you want to continue to be. This is a time for reflection and for gratitude.